We're just letting people log in real quickly. Give us one minute. We'll begin here shortly. All right. On the first day of fall, September 22nd, the autumn solstice has begun. I am anxiously awaiting with unbridled anticipation the battle of the bots. So as you know, Alpine has a monthly webinar series, and uh, one of the topics that's near and dear to everybody's heart is the AMR versus the goods to person versus the AGBs. And we've got a full session today to talk about all of the different types of bots and what's happening out there. But before we begin, the information discussed in this session represents the views of the individuals, does not constitute legal advice. Should you consult with the organization's leadership and legal counsel? That being said, let me begin. So my name is Michael Woolen. I am a 30-plus uh, year supply chain veteran. I absolutely love the supply chain industry, and I will be your moderator today. Um, please note that everybody is muted for background noise. We have the comment section or the QA section, so please feel free to go ahead and put your questions in, and we will be taking those throughout the session. In addition to that, if uh, Tom, you go to the next slide for me, what I wanted to do is get a little bit of a poll from our audience. So, um, David, could you please put up the poll questions for us? We just kind of want to see what type of situation we have with some of our participants today. Excellent. Two questions there that'll help us out. Fantastic. All right. So um, it is my honor and privilege to introduce a longtime friend, for fellow Chicagoan, Mr. Tom Ryan. Tom, over to you. Uh, Dave, I think you got to take down the poll. It's down. Maybe. Hey, there we go. Okay, so uh, there we go. Finally, my computer came back awake. So sorry, folks, I appreciate that. Um, so today we're gonna to be going through this and we're gonna be talking about, you know, what is the problem we're trying to solve with autonomous mobile robotics? What is the value and where, where might we see the return? We're also gonna spend time talking about the impacts associated with labor costs, systems and fulfillment. But if you can, uh, before we get into that, let's just kind of get a look at what you all said uh, in response to our poll. So uh, I'm not surprised, 56%, just curious. We'll help you out with that aspect of it. And uh, the idea of conveyors and sortation, I understand that one as well. So, all right. So having said that, uh, we'll go ahead and move on. Got to hit close here and we'll move on and we'll start with what is the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, yes, okay. So, you know, the first, I think one of the bigger issues is, you know, some people call it the great resignation. It's, it's labor shortages and retaining the labor that you have. You know, warehouse work has some interesting aspects to it. But quite honestly, there's a lot of drudge or repetition. And you need to be able to engage operators where they add value and reduce or eliminate the stuff that is drudge, whether you know they view it as drudge, you view it as drudge, how to make the job uh, more meaningful, because uh, there are those things that are just dull and repetitious. You have a, a lot of turnover uh, in the warehousing industry. Uh, you're forced to use temps to fill the gaps. Uh, we had one customer recently where they took us to one of their newest facilities. They had to spring it open pretty quick because of uh, winning a, a large contract. And as we're walking through the facility, the VP of operations looked at me and he says, you know, Tom, you can see about 30 or 40 people here. And of these 30 or 40 people, I only recognized five of them from when I was here last week. His turnover was that bad. So how can you help not only 
retain people better, but uh, how can you help train them easier uh, or more easily, uh, be more prescriptive in what you're asking them to do and help them uh, be able to do their job quickly uh, when they walk in off the street to work for you. Uh, WMSs have a lot to be able to help you along those lines, uh, certainly better than some of the older uh, you know, systems, but uh, AMRs can contribute to this as well. You've got rising labor costs and you need to pay what's uh, effective to be competitive in the labor market, but then how much of that is sustainable across time. You need to worry about speed or excuse me, safety. You know, you, we all have need, to, need for speed, picks per hour, puts per hour, valuable metrics, but you can't improve these numbers without doing something to shift the paradigm. It's the old Deming statistical process control, Six Sigma, whatever name you want to put on it. You've got to lower the river, find the rocks, remove the rocks, and then be able to make things work better. You can only accomplish so much by, quote unquote, cracking the whip. All right. So. Um, Stagnant productivity, you know, it, it kind of ties into the idea of, of how you do the work and changing the paradigm for how the work is done, shift the way it's done, and then you can uh, potentially gain more productivity. So where is the value? What's the, where's the return come from? I think the first thing to understand is autonomous mobile robots, what they're not. They're not inventory reduction. They're not storage type and uh, uh, activity or devices. They're not necessarily just another material handling technology, although obviously they do uh, handle materials for you. But what they really are all about is the idea of operational efficiency, task execution, managing your inventory, moving the inventory, increasing the throughput, more picks per hour uh, or fewer staff to execute the picks per hour, all of that kind of stuff. And they also help you have some increased efficiencies in how you use your capital, because you can actually get to some of this stuff uh, uh, with less capital investment than you might have done some of your other uh, fixed automation devices. So what's the labor impact? Well, it first off, they go after the drudge. Have the AMRs do the mundane. Have them do the shuttle shuttling back and forth. Have your operators do the complex or the value add or the thing that requires a human uh, interpretation or flexibility. This can drive up your productivity. On top of that, when you take the drudge out of the work, let the robots do it, you're increasing some of the satisfaction for your labor. Also, depending upon the AMR vendor, you might be able to have a little uh, gamification, if you will, uh, of, of the activities they're doing that they're doing, giving them positive reinforcement, help them see how they're doing right there on the screens on the robots as the robots are flashing by. Uh, you can also, uh, in conjunction with the WMS, be able to focus your management and training attention on those that need it. When we look at um, improved operational efficiency and, and, and better uh, productivity that we can get uh, in this environment, uh, I know we've had some people ask the question about, well, what can you expect when you look at applying these? Depending upon who you talk to, because it also uh, is tailored to the uh, type of uh, environment or type of solution you're asking the uh, AMR to do, it is real to sit back and say, uh, double the productivity measures of the past, in some cases, three times the productivity measures of the past. Uh, one uh, case study I, I've read uh, talked about going from 78 picks per hour per operator to 150 plus picks per hour per operator. Uh, some people were talking 35 to 40 percent improvement in picking. Uh, one looked at uh, tripling the number of orders that they could they could pick in a day. So there are some real numbers that are associated with this that you have the potential to gain in the areas in that where you, you are applying. So that drives us towards the cost impact. That was the idea of where the savings are, but where's the cost at? Well, you can actually still purchase these things, uh, the traditional capital purchase approach where you own them. Uh, and But then there's this advent that they've included now, which is called Robot as a Service or RAS. And, some people look at it and say, oh, you mean leasing it? 
Well, kind of and not. Uh, essentially, your monthly fee is per vehicle um, and as opposed to an upfront purchase. You, in your agreement, you agree to what you want the size of your fleet to be, but then they have the opportunity to help you flex the size of your fleet. With a, a week or two weeks notice, they can bring in, they meaning the vendor, can bring in more robots uh, in order to enable you to accommodate a peak season, a promotion uh, uh, spike in, in, in demand, uh, whatever. And the idea of adding a new vehicle into your fleet is a very simple task. Basically, you turn it on, the robots talk to each other about five minutes later, the sucker is ready to run around and do work. Uh, in addition to that, you have the opportunity for them to manage the maintenance, them meaning the vendor, manage the maintenance and manage the maintenance of the vehicle as well as the software. And they, they're able to do that and proactive in doing that and that they have the ability to monitor the fleet, monitor the transaction execution, react to real-time issues, uh, see how each individual robot is doing uh, and deal with uh, maintenance, both preemptive and uh, reaction. So the next piece to look at here is the idea of traditional systems layers control. What, what, is the, what is the system's impact? The robots are there to do a function, but the software needs to tie into how you're running your entire warehouse. So you need to look at the WMS, whether you have a WES or WCS, the PLCs or microcomputers that are controlling your Pictolite, controlling your conveyors, controlling the uh, AMRs, all of that has got to tie together. Typically, that's involved in how the WMS does it. So when we look at this, we want to have a task management model that is sensible to your real world situation. The task management model, by that I mean, it, it's a software vision for how the real world works. How do I model the real world in the software? And as you look at these task management models, you need to make sure that they're fulfillment driven. It's essentially reverse planning. What needs to be shipped when, and then how do I work back in the warehouse or into my suppliers to make sure I have the right product, right place, right time in order to be able to execute, execute the fulfillment domain. Then you have to worry about dealing with constrained resources. The labor I have their availability or what they're trained to, as well as what they're trained to do. Uh, the material handling equipment or the other automated equipment that's involved. You get into deal, dealing with geographic constraints, you know, like the starting movement, starting point of where the task movement has to come from, where it's got to end up. Are there any intermediate stages or processes? Are there any obstacles? Uh, do you have a conveyor in, in the way that prevents you from going from where you are to where you need to be, you've got to go around instead. That's, those are the, that's what I mean about geographic constraints. All of these tasks, receipt, put away, picking, replenishment, they all need some level of direction or management. So the idea of system directed work, how do you have your system, typically the WMS, direct the other players in the mix to do the right work at the right time. I'm gonna, I have another uh, slide. I wanna deal with this tax execution, task execution poker game uh, to talk about uh, choosing the right resource to execute the right task. So when we look at the traditional systems control overlap, you're, you're, you're seeing what the, the WMS is dealing with there. Uh, the WES is kind of the guy that sometimes exists, sometimes in the middle. If you have automation, you almost always have some form of warehouse control system, WCS. And the AMR, the AMR fit into the WCS, WES type of environment. Some of the AMR vendors have their own controller that drives the whole thing that is sitting uh, more to the right in the WCS category or being talked to by a WCS. Uh, others tend to rely more on the WMS or a WES to make decisions and to coordinate the interaction of operators and robots together. But this is the classic environment in that you need to figure out where does my AMR solution fit into. You've got to get this right. You've got to get the application of the AMR to the right transaction type or the right environment, as well as how do I control it most effectively. And it takes both to end up with a successful implementation. So task management model, you know, fulfillment operations about managing many tasks. You've got multiple types of tasks. You've got them all happening at the same time, a multi-threaded approach. Each of the tasks may have an entirely different flow that it's got to go through. 
Well, success in that environment is all about the right task executed in the right sequence. You know, you want put away to, to reserve uh, so that you've got product available for replenishment to happen. You want replenishments to execute before the picks uh, get to the pick forward pick location and they don't have product. You got to juggle all of that stuff. What's the right resource to execute that task? I think one of the better ways of looking at how AMRs fit into your environment is not necessarily figuring out, thinking of them as another fixed automation, but almost like they're a, another operator. So you, but you need to still juggle what you're dealing with operators, what you're dealing with AMRs, what you're doing with uh, any fixed automation you may have like pick the light or ASRs. And all along through this whole process, you got to balance those constraints. So how do we get into this balancing the constraints? This comes back to what I call the poker game. I came up with this methodology for trying to explain how WMSs typically do system-directed work. Now, they all have their own way of doing it. This is kind of a nice logical way to, to enable you to think about how system-directed work is, is done, deciding what is the right resource or the right task and marrying them up at the right time. If you think about the, the, a poker game, well, the players are the tasks that need to be serviced. The pot is the operator that's available or the AMR that's available or the pick the light situation that's available to service a task. It wants a task to execute. And so then the tasks compete to be serviced by that resource or by the pot. And like in a poker game, the first thing that the tasks have to do is they have to make ante. So if I'm looking for a picking, I'm a resource that's capable of doing picking. Well, any, any task that's a put away task can't play. They can't make, they, they, they can't make ante uh, or they require a resource that's not me or you have a geographic constraint. The task requires is located on the fourth level of a, of a rack and the operator is driving a pallet jack and can't lift that up. So that's the idea of, of making anti. Once you get down to all the individuals, all the individual tasks that can be serviced by the resource, then you come up with a, a logical best hand algorithm. That might be driven by priority of the task. Very often it's driven by the proximity of the task to where the resource is currently located, minimizing deadhead, that kinds of things. So this is the kind of game that's played in order to come up with the right solution for system directed work. Part of that direction is what do I want the AMRs to do? And then finally, how do you apply AMRs? So AMRs, you know, it's, they are another material handling solution. They are a resource that you can use to execute tasks, but they don't do everything. They're not flexible to the extent that a human can be. Uh, but they're more flexible in, in the context of what conveyors can do, even pick the lights or ASRs. Uh, so what are some of the fulfillment environments that lend themselves to the application of AMR solutions? The, the primary area where these are very, uh, traditionally been very successful at is the idea of a B2C pick, pack, and ship environment. I'm picking it product into cases, cartons, pallets, whatever you want to call them, uh, totes, and I'm getting them out the building. There is some application success and presence in a B2B fulfillment model. Obviously in a B2B model, you could still have the pick, pack and ship type situation going on, but you may also be doing case picking, building mixed SKU pallets that you're gonna ship LTL to your business customer. There has been a long history of AMRs and their predecessor AGVs, automatic guided vehicles, being involved in internal moves conveying material without having a conveyor obstacle in the middle of the floor. Uh, a shuttle move that doesn't need an operator to drive back and forth all day. Uh, the key is finding the right application for that you need an AMR for and then applying the right AMR to be able to, to execute in your environment. So what are some specific examples? And we're gonna deal with these a little bit more here. The idea of a goods to person type environment. This is a good, goods to person is a variation, if you will, on pick, on batch picking. Uh, I'm taking a bunch of product to a packing station. Uh, for example, a, a pallet worth of product that I'm gonna turn into individual envelopes with one thing in each envelope. That's a batch pick, right? 
Well, a goods to person approach is very similar to that. Not necessarily the whole pallet movements, but very similar to that. Then you have the order to person variation. This is where the operators are op staying in a zone. They're not walking around a lot. And the AMR goes to them and asks them for specific stuff for the carton, the totes, whatever it's carrying. This is a variation on cart picking, quite honestly, in the sense that you would populate cart with cartons, totes, whatever, you assign them to orders. The operator would typically then use a handheld, drag the cart behind them, wander through the entire warehouse, and gradually fill up all of the totes, and then take them back to a packing station. There was one example uh, anecdote given where an operator was talking about how they love the AMRs. And the reason they love the AMR so much is, he says, before we got the AMRs, I was doing cart picking through the warehouse. And by the time I got the cart filled up, I was carrying a dragon behind me four or 500 pounds. And, and that, that's, that's kind of drudge, right? And then he said, on top of that, I, I was using a, 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 a step counter on my wrist, you know, and it was telling me I was walking anywhere between 10 and 12 miles every eight hour shift dragging 400 pound carts. This was tough. When the AMRs came along, I love them, man. I don't drag the carts anymore. And I'm down to walking maybe four or five miles, not 12 miles every eight hour shift. That's just one example. Um, the idea of uh, mixed skew case picking to a shipping pallet. Think walk aisle se sequence movement. Uh, it, it's, it's like picking to a cart, except you're putting cases on a pallet. Same idea. Let's reverse the operation. Let's start doing putaways with these devices. Uh, and, and that can be a variation on a mixed skew pallet pick feeding uh, a put away operation. Uh, then you get into the idea of replenishment, directing cases. In, think of a cascaded uh, replenishment operation. I have a pick the light system. I need to put cases on the back side of the case flow rack so that the operators on the front side can do their each picking. Well, I've got to pick those cases out of my reserve. That, that's an example of what we're talking about here. And then the idea of long distance product movement moving back and forth between A and B. Let's take a look at the first example. And the first example we're going to look at is, is goods to person. And that goods to person we're going to highlight in this uh, pink area, salmon colored area here, right? And so the vehicles receive instructions to pick up a cart, a, a mobile rack that has product on different shelves. They pick up the pallet, they, they pick up the rack, and they carry it down to this goods to person pack station. So you've got multiple AMRs queuing up and the front AMR is, is the operator is being directed either by a screen or by lights or whatever, what to pick from that cart, which is carrying this mobile rack and then displaying and then depositing the product into cartons or totes that need to be uh, then shipped out. Once that cart gets done, it goes and takes the mobile rack and it puts it back in the uh, bins, the, the bulk storage area that this is, uh, high density storage that we're talking about here, and then rinse and repeat. Here are some examples of robots that fit this. This is a very early on application of, of AMR. So there is a lot of, of uh, choice with regard to who the vendors are that can do this kind of work. Essentially, you see the idea of the small AMR coming up underneath and picking up this tote. And in this case, they just kind of drag the tote or, or the mobile rack around because they've got wheels. Uh, this one is carrying it on its back. Down here, the NVIDIA robot actually pulls a tote or a bin off of the shelf and takes it to the operator or takes it to a pick area. This center picture here from Scalog actually kind of shows the window. These robots would appear in this white area, you know, basically on the other side of this image. They would appear in this white area. And then the screen here would tell the operator what to pick. And up at the top here, you see this little black box. That's actually a light beam. And it would shine on what portion, what shelf, what position of the AMR. Uh, where the items were to pick, and then the screen would tell them how many they would pick it, and they would put it into the appropriate tote. Hey, Tom. So, um, you know, our our experience here, obviously, everybody knows Tiva got bought by Amazon, and then there's a bunch of different um, goods-to-person technologies that have actually been brought to market. 
And one of the things that Alpine's been helping a lot of our customers with is the appropriate sizing of the MSU, that mobile stocking unit, to make sure that you can accommodate as many pick bases on the mobile stocking units as well. And then the um, packing station or the PPS, you know, really understanding the design based on your order profile and how many uh, orders and batching and uh, put the light. So, um, you know, it's interesting. Everybody thinks about, you know, the small, minute details of an MSU and how many are out there and the throughput and then the actual design of the PPS. And then more importantly, we're going to talk about some different goods to person technology and, you know, your bell shaped curve and the number of items are really going to also have an impact on what the right, you know, either goods to person technology or AMR with the mobile stocking unit are for your operation. So we've got a, a situation where we've got, you know, three different types. Uh, of automation in this in the same building based on the different order profiles so just something to think about totally i mean the devil is in the details with anything right and there's no exception here's an order to person approach so here the area we're going to focus on is over here on the right of the screen and uh get our operators seg segregated out into the different zones and in this situation you have a carton induction station down at the bottom where the AMR shows up and an operator down there is instructed what size totes or cartons or parcel you know, containers to put onto the, to onto the AMR and what orders they are associated with. The AMR then learns what its instructions are, where does it need to go? It then takes off into the, uh, in this case, we're looking at an each forward pick example where you've got shelving, uh, an operator standing up can reach all the spots. And they go there, the operator sees them arrive, they see the instructions on the face of the robot, or maybe they're using a handheld or a vision, uh, you know, a vision device on their glasses or uh, voice, and they're getting instructed what to put on the robot. The robot does its thing uh, and moves forward into the next pick location as it finally gets all the stuff filled up. And then when the robot is done, it doesn't need any services anymore. It comes down to this packing station area operator here takes the stuff off the robot and then the robot gets back in line to get more stuff on it as i say rinse and repeat uh, it's a very reasonably efficient operation you can get some fairly high uh, uh throughput through this this is the example uh that i mentioned earlier where they were looking at almost 150 picks per hour uh per person in this area what are some of the companies that do this Again, this is one of the earlier environments that this has been done in a lot. You've got these different uh, suppliers and you can see you know, similarities in how some of the robots look, but then again, they've got different stuff on top that they can carry around. And this then comes back to you know, how does it fit in your environment? So you see them here carrying totes that need to be processed here. They're carrying the actual uh, cartons that are being filled, minimizing you know, the additional handling later on. Again, Tom, the, the, devil's, the devil's in the details on that last one, right? So we've got a candle manufacturer that has a, um, uh, a, a system going in, and then all of a sudden they realize that their average order is about 50 pounds. So now they're weighing out their AMR. So you really need to think about the product, the commodity, what the order profile looks like when you design these. But I want to go back to something here. So on these... Um, these smart carts, right? So a lot of your off the shelf WMSs do the cartonization and then they actually have, you know, batch cart picking logic. So where does that reside? Is that still in the WMS or is that in the AMR, Tom? Uh, it is a negotiation between your AMR supplier and you and how does it fit best into your IT architecture? I personally come from the camp that I think the WMS ought to be doing that, and then the AMR ought to be doing the execution of it, uh, simply because the WMS has the visibility of the entire order. But some of the AMR guys have been building the software to where you can hand off the order to them and they will execute it. That works if everything in the order is in the area where the robot is going to be serviced. If not, you need the WMS to segregate out, here's the stuff I want the AMR to do over in the goods to person area or the order to person area. Here's the one I want 
an operator to do with a fork truck to pick uh, cases uh, for the LPL part of it. And here's the pallets that I want to go. It depends on the order. It, it is a part of the design. When I talked earlier about putting the IT architecture together to ensure the proper flow and process is carried from the beginning to the end, that, that is a big piece, not just what's the type of vehicle, how much load can it handle, and, and what does my warehouse look like? It, all of that has to go here. So let's take it on. We'll now move over to an area where we've got the pallet racks, and we're talking about in this case, it's the idea of mixed skew case pick to a pallet. So when you looked over here before in the last slide where we were talking about uh, order to person and the person was filling, doing an each pick, pack and ship, this is the same concept over here, except the stuff's bigger. I'm putting cases on a pallet. I'm not putting eaches in a carton, but I'm building a pallet that is mixed skews that is going to go probably LTL to a customer. And so you have the same idea, the, op the, the robot picks up an empty pallet, uh, goes to the operators, works their way through, the operators do their thing, they fill it up, the robot then delivers it to either a staging or a dock door, and, and it goes back and does it again. Here are uh, two different uh, robot forms that are capable of doing this. Down at the bottom here, the robot, uh, the one that's labeled Fetch Robotics, the robot is carrying the pallet on its back and you can't hardly see it, but in this environment, this operator has voice on their head and a vision thing, uh, uh, you know, a heads up display on their glasses. And so in this case, there's a WES -E involved instructing the operator, meet the robot here and now do this for the robot while the robot waits for that to happen. Up here, the interaction is, uh, you have a pallet mover, a pallet jack that's carrying three different pallets. And there is a screen. I can't see it in this picture. I should have done a better job on the picture. But there's a screen that tells the operator what to do. And on top of that, you have a pick and put bar across the top here. So you can see the numbers of what is to be picked and how much for each of the pallet positions. And there was a light beam on this one when I saw it in the video where it was actually shining down on which corner of the pallet were they trying to put the product, you know, the whole idea about building a stable pallet. That's always one of the challenges. And the other thing that I want to represent in this is that this particular robot in this picture, same robot, is self-directed, moving itself along. It's actually an autonomous control system added to an existing operator-driven type of vehicle. And so over here, the operator has jumped on it and the operator is going to drive it to another part of the warehouse. In this case, this particular vehicle allows you to do both. A little bit unusual. The next is I really the idea like of... This. So I really like this solution, but it, again, it comes back to, it's got to be the right case pick environment. It's got to minimize travel. And you also have to build the pallet heavy to light on that stackability. Um, believe it or not, we've got a couple of apparel footwear clients that this is the perfect opportunity for to really build those mixed pallets and, and an outbound approach to minimize travel versus, you know, a double walkie rider pallet jack where you travel the whole, you know, 300,000 square feet and, you know, you're building these mixed pallets and the most you can do in one trip is, you know, two pallets. So, you know, this definitely based on an average order profile of call it, you know, four to six of mixed two pallets. It's a, it's a great fit, but again, the product has to be, um, you know, open to this environment. Yeah, and, and it also ties back in again to the idea of devil and the details. You want to slot the warehouse right in order to not only function against the volume, but it function against the rules with regard to how you build a mixed pallet. Uh, and that, depending on the order, then the pallets can begin in different zones or in different parts of that racking area. They don't necessarily have to travel the entire rack. But again, it's back to how do you design the whole piece, tie together the material handling, the, the storage technology, the slotting, the positioning, and, and you know building waves and stuff like that. So in this environment, we're looking at the opposite. I'm not picking now, I'm putting away. So I have a induction point at the beginning up here near where my receiving area is. 
and I'm taking product from the receiving dock and I'm putting it onto uh, AMRs and I'm directing them to go do the put away. So the first of these examples is the idea of replenishing that each pick, uh, putting away direct from receiving into the each forward pick area. And it's, you know, I mean, there's no rocket science in this. The robots get filled up, they go execute, they visit the operators, the operators see the screen, the operators put it away, the robots return, rinse and repeat, and I do it all over again. Same idea with doing it into the forward pick area of cases. I've got individual cases coming in at receiving. I put them on an AMR. The AMRs disappear into the stacks and the operators in those areas pick them up, put them away, and then the robot returns and does it again. Uh, you could have something similar with regard to uh, direct replenishment from receiving into the pick the light area. Uh, this is uh, this little image is uh, the pick the light conveyor down the middle, the case flow rack on either side here with operators to replenish the backside of the case flow rack. Again, AMRs put it on them. They do, they drive to the area. They An operator in the area takes it off and puts it away. Robots return and do it again. And then a variation on this. And so the, some of the form formats that will deal with this are you're, you're seeing these things again. And the reason you're seeing these things again is they're still capable of handling the same product. We're just asking to reverse the flow. Instead of picking up, starting empty and being filled, they're starting filled and they're being put away. A similar play on this is to blend the idea of the mixed skew case, uh, mixed case skew palette going out the door into a mixed case, mixed skew palette doing replenishment. In this case, this example of the pick the light area. So again, the, the vehicles come through, they uh, go into the area, they pick up what they need from the operators, they go and they see other operators, the operators empty them out, and then bingo, you have them return. Similar formats, you've seen all these formats. This is a, a different format than you saw before. It's a single pallet, pallet jack. The operator doesn't get on it like you could over here. It has the full AMR guidance. It can drive around on its own, but you could also grab it with an, uh, an operator can just grab it and take over and drive it manually. Now, the final one I want to talk about is the idea of long distance product movement. And this is the idea of uh, I'm receiving product pallets from my stretch wrappers at the end of manufacturing line, and I need to put them away into my warehouse. And this is a long back and forth, back and forth all day long. Do you want an operator doing that, driving a fork truck into the ground? I know when I worked at Proctor, I had one of my fork trucks, uh, clamp truck actually. Uh, I had three batteries for that thing because it would burn through three ba two batteries every shift. Uh, and it simply because of how much it was moving back and forth. And in this environment, I'm showing an image where I have an obstacle. I can't come across the shipping dock. I've got to go around to get to the other area. So here we just have the operator, the uh, vehicle picks up at manufacturing when it sees one, it drives over here, it sets it down. Uh, I'm showing it as a shuttle drive as opposed to it's actually going to go do the put away. Uh, there are vehicles that are capable of actually doing full blown put away. Um, you know, the, the, uh, a fork truck that's got AMR automation for the movement and then additional automation for uh, inserting pallets in and taking pallets out of racks. But again, it's the same idea, rinse and repeat. So you got a vehicle running back and forth all day. And some of the examples that fit this, um, you've got, um, this is one of those robots that can actually lift up and put stuff up higher on uh, shelves other than the floor. You've seen the Seagrid version, which is a pallet jack. You could also have a tugger. Uh, I know in one of my uh, prior lives, we had a tugger that was pulling five trailers. And by the time we filled up the trailers, the tugger was pulling, uh, I think 10,000 pounds, and it was hauling at 400 meters from one end of a really large warehouse to the other. And, uh, and then down here, we've got a couple examples of AMRs working with what are called pickup and drop off stations. Uh, the Seagrid type could actually set it down on a floor, you know, a, a, a spot on the floor. This is the type where it carries the pallet on its back. So it needs a uh, device to pick it up from and set it down. So, hey, Tom. 
just real yeah. quickly, I want to remind everybody that uh, please use your chat and your QA to submit questions, and we'll address those throughout the uh, the presentation. So just a little reminder as we uh, continue here, Tom. You got it. And so now we come to the final takeaway part of this. And in this area, here's the things I want you to walk away from this presentation with, and hopefully I've given you enough information to where you can. One, AMR savings are real. They're studies, they're anecdotal evidence. This is not leading edge stuff when applied in the appropriate way. AMRs are, in many ways, just another material handling solution. So application of that technology is key. You heard Michael and I talk a couple times about the devil in the details. How does it fit? Uh, how do I treat it? You know, I've talked about, yes, it's another material handling automation solution, but you know what? An operator on a fork truck is a material handling solution. Maybe you think of these things like they're operators on fork trucks, only they have different assignments. The technology is proven. The guidance system on these BCs is amazing. I was the first guy at Proctor 200 years ago to successfully implement automatic guided vehicles in a manufacturing environment. Uh, I, I was really amazed that I talked them into trying the fourth time. The, uh, there were three other projects before mine that didn't work and we managed to succeed. And that was all wire guided. Today, you've got automatic guided vehicles getting additional lease on life in that they're putting AMR level uh, controls and and, and guidance systems on them to where they're not tied to a wire in the floor anymore. Uh, so the guidance systems are there, they're proven. It's fun to watch them. Uh, you, you can see this if you go to the different websites, you see them in the videos, they'll throw a box on the floor in front of an, uh, uh, an AMR. The AMR will recognize it and then figure out how to go around it. Or if the obstacle is too great, the AMR will turn around and find a new route to get to where it's going. The solution cost is flexible as well as scalable. We talked about the idea of the RAS versus the capital purchase. Offsetting uh, as a monthly expense instead of capital, having someone else manage uh, the robots and the maintenance of the robots so that you're not actually hiring staff and trying to train that you have them get trained on how to do that or asking you know, your in-house in mechanics to learn an entirely different technology that may be uh, a technical skill that they're not they don't currently have it, there's a lot of ways to be able to make this affordable some of the anecdotes some of the case studies will talk about uh paybacks uh measured in months not years um the fulfillment model is foundational to the success and so the fulfillment model is the application of the right robotic form factor to the right real world material handling, product movement, task movement situation with the control system and the, uh, the architecture of how the controls work together, appropriately applied, figured out, executed. And that's the AMR control piece in the last bullet. So having said that, Michael, what do we have for questions from folks? So just a reminder, please use your chat to ask questions. Uh, the first one uh, specifically, or the Q&A, um, the first question was, will this PowerPoint be available afterwards? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, the second one uh, from our participants is, um, how did these units perform in a frozen or produce warehouse um, with potential wet surfaces? And the second part is, uh, we're exploring the application for some uh, in our warehouse, but it's critical that they can just to the uh, different type environments. So the idea of going into a cold space, uh, these vehicles have the same issues or problems or capabilities that you would expect of a fork truck. Um, so if they're, if they're properly prepped for that environment, they will work fine. Um, the electronics are the same way. This comes back to choosing the right vendor and the right form factor to go in there. So I'm not saying all the AMRs can do it, but I'm saying there are AMRs that can. Um, wet surfaces, it's just like any other vehicle. A wet surface is a problem, you've got to deal with it. Now, the issue here uh, on a safety point of view is that um, when you have operators on fork trucks in a high, high velocity environment, you have a significant risk associated with you know, collisions or interactions with people in an inappropriate way between vehicles and the operators on the floor. AMRs are actually much better at managing that uh, than, than people tend to be. 
Um, and so what was the other question, Michael? Just uh, being able to handle the different temperature control environments. So I think we've got that covered. Um, we do have another question. Um, so we talked a little bit about the WMS and its ability to do the cartonization and the batch picking and should that reside within WMS or the AMR. What about the waveless picking? How does an AMR fit into a waveless picking environment? Well, you know, waveless picking, <laughs> I've been doing warehouses for like 40 years and waveless picking is kind of like the first really new concept uh, compared to when I was involved in building systems back in the day when we customized, customized them to depth. And it's really slick in the sense that, you know, a new order comes in and you just drop it into being executed. Well, that is a really good fit in a B2C pick, pack and ship uh, operational environment. These robots work really well in that kind of environment. That's the environment where they cut their teeth, so to speak. That's where Kiba started. Uh, and then Amazon bought them. And then because Amazon bought Kiba, a lot of people left <laughs> Kiba and started other companies like Six Rivers and Locust. We have a whole industry now because of that acquisition. And it all started out in the B2C environment. Waveless technology works really well in a B2C environment. There is an opportunity there for a really good fit. Excellent. So, Tom, obviously, uh, we, we, you know, battle of the pot and we know that labor is tough to get. And, uh, you know, we're looking at automating some mundane processes and trying to reduce, uh, re reduce our, our demand on labor. How do you recommend the change management for, you know, the existing team to embrace these new robots in their environment? Um, you know, I would also tell you that one of the things that some of the AMR vendors have done a really nice job of is a lot of interviews and a lot of videos to help explain their story. There are some videos out there that actually address this very specifically. And in one environment, they were talking about the workers were thinking that this was going to take my job. Uh, you know, I'm going to be, be replaced by a robot. But then involving them and in understanding what the robots are going to do for them versus what they're going to do for the robot and how that works together and beginning to see how you're taking the drudge away from what I do, back to my example of dragging a 400 pound cart doing a batch pick on a cart. Uh, the adoption, uh, the, the fear went away and the adoption and uh, enthusiasm grew. So you do need, you know, I, I do a lot of software selection work as well as other things. You gotta involve the people that are gonna have to live with the thing early on in the design early on and understanding what it can do and, and, and crafting the justification, make sure that they re recognize that they have had an opportunity to contribute and that they have been heard and that the solution is going after not necessarily only the things that are of concern to them and not necessarily only the things that are of concern to management, but that you're going after both of them. You're handling the as is today things that have to be accomplished and you're enabling a future forward direction. If you involve them, they tend to they tend to buy in. Does that answer the question, Michael? You bet. So again, please feel free to use the Q&A and the chat uh, to submit any more questions. Um, Tom, you know, we, we've been working together for a really long time. And, and I know, um, you know, the, the strength of who you are is obviously due to West Point, And there's a very significant woman in your life. I, I, I heard a rumor, today's your anniversary. Is that true? Uh, yes, it is. It is true. Number 48. Happy anniversary. 48 years. Oh, that's awesome, man. Congratulations. I, I truly uh, am excited for you and the, and the family. So that's awesome. Well, her news. patience well, knows no bounds if she's been hooked up with me. <laughs> I think I can relate. Um, that being said, Tom, on the behalf of the entire Alpine team, we're so glad to have you part of us and you know, working with you and, and, and your experience has been, you know, ab absolutely wonderful. Uh, for those participants, thank you so much for taking a little time out of your day to learn a little bit about the Battle of the Bots inside the four walls. And um, if you need any more information, please feel free to reach out to Alpine. We'd be more than happy to help you either do a storage type analysis, an ROI, a justification, or anything along those lines to help you find the right Goods to person, AMR, AGV technology for your operation. 
And uh, we always recommend a crawl, walk, run approach. Um, so for those of you that have not known Alpine does the monthly webinars, next month we've got HR incentives. So Brenda Stoltz, uh, operation background from Boeing, Target.com, and she really puts the L in labor. So we're really excited to have her uh, do her session next month. We are doing this in combination with WERC, W-E-R-C. Uh, they are really excited about the HR initiative, uh, specifically with the labor challenges that is uh, taking place out there. So I hope you guys can all tune in. Uh, you can register through WERC. Uh, we will have that on our website. And then obviously uh, today's session, the recording and the PowerPoint will be sent out as well. So on behalf of the entire Alpine team, thanks for joining this month's uh, webinar series, and we hope to see you in future sessions. Thanks and have a great day.